content warning. Rule of Rose includes pretty much everything. Rule of Rose is a game I've been recommended and warned of in equal measure since creating this channel, and I actually put off playing it for quite some time. I had heard it was a beautifully nuanced and lore-rich experience, one that would require me to take it very seriously not only because the game itself is deserving of my earnesty, but also because the fan base is particularly passionate. So while all those things appealed to me deeply, onto the back burner it went because as someone more idiot than savant, passionate fan bases scare me more than death itself. If you lay a finger on her, Travis, I swear to God, I will fucking destroy you. If you're familiar with my work, you know that I delight in undergoing serious research, heavy scripting, and even conducting interviews with people involved with development. However, this is all done while doing my best to be as funny and entertaining as possible, all which hopefully result in a kind of Damoclean tightrope walk between idiocy and intelligence. We must find that woman. So where then, wandering decidedly down what Conan O'Brien so poetically refers to as the phantom intersection between smart and stupid, will I end up with Rule of Rose, a game that is made up of the most breathtaking and genius pieces of storytelling the medium has ever seen, with music that makes me want to simultaneously cry, dance, and reminisce, with characters so fully realized and with so little for me to just make fun of overall. This task is all the more terrifying when you consider how many other YouTubers, basically all of whom are much more popular and well acquainted with the source material than I am, have already tread this ground and essayed this game to death. With all these incredible people having said so much, what room is there to be left for me? Reverse. Reverse. Shit. Am I really going to come away with, from this experience with something truly my own to share with my audience? Well, this is exactly what makes Rule of Rose so special. After pushing these doubts to the side, I finally played it, and after just over 13 hours in this world with these incredible characters, I think I do actually have something of my own to say. And while I can definitely promise you if you're a huge Rule of Rose fan, much of this ground is going to be retreaded for you, I'm going to do my absolute best to make it worth your time, and I hope there's something for you here as well. I also apologize ahead of time for anything I may mess up or get wrong. It is my sincerest hope in discussing this extremely important game that I can bring something to the table worth more than any fumblings I make along the way. Rule of Rose was perhaps the most splendidly gorgeous, masterfully crafted, tear-jerkingly tender, and deeply horrifying gaming experiences I've ever had. While it's not perfect by any means, it is maybe one of the most important stories ever told in the medium of video games and well worth experiencing despite its shortcomings, especially to hardcore fans of the genre. There are numerous things that set Rule of Rose apart from the likes of its psychological horror counterparts such as Silent Hill, but I think the biggest one is its ability to reach out to its players in a way far more relatable than any other offerings in its genre. Horror fans like me, and likely you, often seek out games like these because we're drawn to their darkness and the fractured psyches of their characters, right? There's a tangible sense of grime and gristle that attracts us to these titles, and while we can often relate to them somewhat, at least for me anyway, it's only relatable in a kind of abstract way. For example, I relate to themes of Silent Hill 2, to the expressions of Silent Hill 2, but I don't relate to James Sunderland as a person, and assuming you're not watching this from a prison cell or institution, I would wager you don't either. But that's what makes that game so great. The characters are more like themed canvases for us to draw our own interpretations upon and less like fully fledged portraits of people we really feel like we know who are experiencing scenarios we've also experienced. So yeah, I loved this game and I felt like it could very well have been my favorite game I play for this series of every PS2 horror game, which is part of why this video is so much longer than what I normally do. However, that opinion did not go untested for very long and before I knew it, this delicious delicacy that made me weep like a child longing for a time I never knew turned on me like a gas station hot dog.
Rule of Rose is a 2006 survival horror game developed by now-defunct development studio Punchline, a studio made up of just 25 people who reportedly got tasked with making a horror game by Sony. One of the brightest stars of Punchline's team, and someone who seems to come up the most when talking about Rule of Rose, was Yoshira Kimura, which at first confused me a little bit, as he was only credited as being responsible for the game's draft proposal, and the game was actually directed by Shuji Ishikawa. That confusion lasted until I got a hold of an interview clip where Kimura goes into a bit more detail on his duties on Rule of Rose and how important he really was, as he wasn't just the story creator, he was also the director of the CG cutscenes, which are maybe the most breathtaking part of the game. For the CG cutscenes, he also wrote the dialogue and supervised the English, which he goes into very interesting detail on in the interview, saying, Thinking back on Rule of Rose, it's a work that I'm very personally attached to, but with everything else going on, I haven't been able to talk about it much. It's not like it's a bad story or anything, I've just been thinking a lot lately about how much Rule of Rose meant to me, so I thought maybe I should actually start telling my story somewhere. That was probably the first and last time that I've worked on a horror game and a game with realistic characters, as well as a game with CG cutscenes. I never really made a game with that many CG movies. You've probably heard me say before that I'm not crazy about cutscenes, and I feel like if you have to have them, the shorter the better. This was the only time I felt like it was a special case. It felt like a challenge. I thought to myself, I guess I'll give it a shot. I think the interesting part of this game development tale was the movie making part. Boy, was it a lot of work. It was super hard, and at the time, I was... Well, to be totally honest, I had to go to the hospital for a pretty big surgery. In the recording, everyone always just goes to America, but this game was set in England. So I decided, let's go to England and record actual British voiceover for it. It was a bit difficult to make happen, but I did it. The motion capture for these movies was also a bit harder than traditional motion capture. All of the actors were, uh dogs and children, so that was a bit of a challenge. Also, when I was directing the CG, we had to think a lot about how much you could actually convey just from the acting. Plus, we needed to do a lot of close-up shots, and we didn't have any sort of facial capture tech at the time. So when I told everyone what we needed, we had to come up with a plan together. And we started making the CG, the team told me, Kimura-san, you're gonna have to act this out. Don't just explain to us what you need Amanda to do. You do it. There's a scene where she's putting lipstick on and going, eh, you know, that's scene, I have now personally had this kind of rich experience. It was tougher than usual, but the whole experience, recording audio and motion capture, I think it really informed how I approach things on No More Heroes also. After that, when I had to do motion capture on any game, I started to think about how we could improve the setup, not just technically, but also for the actors. God, this man is adorable. He would go on to create Onion Games, a scrappy little indie developer made up of a team of just three people, one of which being Kimura and the other being Compose. Composer Hirofumi, Hiro, Hirofumi Taniguchi. What up? I can pronounce things. Taniguchi, by the way, also was a member of Punchline. But another interesting cat who worked on Rule of Rose was Tomo Akita, credited as one of the game's writers. He has various credits, including being a very large part of Shadows of the Damned, but what I find most interesting about Akita is that he was the director of Lollipop Chainsaw, working alongside your hero and mine, Goichi Suda. Let's all just sit for a moment and think about Goichi Suda. If you could make a Batman video game, what would it be like? I would create a Batman game where Batman only rides the Batmobile. He doesn't get out. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> He's just in that damn Batmobile all the time. The game was produced by first-time producer Noriyuka Boda, who, get this, while working on Rule of Rose, was also working as the cinematics producer on Rumble Roses XX, a female fighting wrestling game owned by more than a few of you fucking DJs watching this right now. Don't lie. Punchline is only credited as making one other game besides Rule of Rose, which was their first game, Tulip, a cute little life sim RPG about kissing, building relationships, equitable living, and class struggle? <laughs> It's a really weird game, but after playing through a bit of Tulip, I couldn't help but wish they would have carried over the voices from Tulip over to Rule of Rose. Okay, we have now ended the spoiler-free section of this video. I'm sorry, <laughs> this entire video from here on will contain every spoiler. Because this story is both the most important part of the game, but also very hard to explain in a traditional, here's a rundown of the plot I usually do. Hey, I'm Cliff, and these are my notes. 
we're going to be taking something of an unorthodox path to retelling this story. The primary reason for this is that it's a story that essentially exists in servitude to its twists and reveals. So instead of trying to lead you to the twist and pulling the rug back, I'm just going to lay it all out for you in plain language, then we're going to go back through the game knowing the full story, carrying my initial gameplay experiences with us as we go, for comparative context. So, if you want the true experience, go get it. You deserve to. It's an incredible game. The story of Rule of Rose takes place in the early 20th century and concerns a 19-year-old girl named Jennifer who, as a little girl, survived a blimp crash which claimed the life of her parents as well as the lives of everyone else on board while on a long-distance flight from England to India in June of 1929. As she takes a bus through the English countryside, she's woken up by a young boy eager for her to read a storybook he seems to have made, but just as Jennifer notices many of the pages are blank, he turns tail and exits the bus, causing her to chase him through the room countryside as the bus speeds off, leaving her behind. Jennifer, having lost the boy, begins exploring her surroundings and finds that she's stuck here as the road continues to wind her back to this very spot if she tries to follow after the bus. An incredibly neat touch that will make a little bit more sense later down the line. She does eventually catch sight of the boy again after coming upon a dog collar and a decrepit shack, and the boy leads us to Rose Garden Orphanage, or what's left of it anyway. After being taunted by various children hiding throughout its dilapidated remains, she makes her way inside and finds the building seemingly devoid of all signs of life, save for a bouquet of freshly cut roses and little bag head dudes who block our entry to various other rooms. Eventually, she comes face to face with the boy from the bus, now perched atop an altar of sorts, surrounded by candles. He gives us more of the book before an announcement calls out to us that a funeral will begin in the inner court. She makes her way to the courtyard, comes upon a shovel, and finds herself furiously digging until she stumbles upon a coffin inside which lay a burlap sack. She's then accosted by a group of children with bags over their heads as they ceremoniously dump water over her before burying her alive inside the coffin. When she comes to, she finds herself in an airship nestled within the endless sky, and this airship serves as the primary location for much of the game's playtime. While on the airship, we're made to follow the callous demands of a children's hierarchy named the Red Crayon Aristocrats, who make up the majority of our primary characters. Okay, so those are your basics. Now let's get into the sauce. If you don't got no sauce, then you're lost. Mm -hmm. But you can also get lost in the sauce. You can get how you get lost in the sauce? Man, a bitch, man, a bitch gonna get lost in the sauce, man. Mm -hmm. You may be wondering how does this girl go from being ceremoniously buried alive to traveling through the sky in a blimp? Okay, so here's rug pull number one. As the story continues, the breadcrumbs begin adding up and it eventually comes to our attention as the player that this entire story isn't exactly a dream, so to speak, as much as an allegorical retelling of Jennifer's own traumatic experience as a child after the airship incident. See, before boarding the bus, she saw some children playing and got triggered, for lack of a better term, sending her into a retrospective introspection through her own childhood trauma, tumbling down a rabbit hole into a kind of fairy tale teenage inception. Contrary to what the game would encourage us to believe on the onset, Jennifer wasn't just a kid who ended up at an orphanage due to being the sole survivor of the blimp accident. Jennifer actually landed a short ways from the orphanage near the home of a pea farmer named Gregory who had recently lost his own son, Joshua, likely to an unspecified illness. He finds her in the wreckage and rescues her, brings her back to his home, and essentially seeks to raise her as his own. Unfortunately for Jennifer, however, due to his already decaying mental state, Gregory inevitably turns Jennifer into a kind of avatar for his dead son, dressing her up in his clothing and even referring to her as Joshua. Jennifer is discovered through Gregory's basement window by Wendy, a girl from a nearby orphanage, leading the two to begin exchanging love letters. One night, Wendy brings her back to said orphanage, where she begins having her dealings with the aforementioned red crayon aristocracy, all while Jennifer and Wendy continue falling in love despite Jennifer revealing that she wasn't a boy as she would have appeared due to Gregory's abuse. However, things at Rose Garden Orphanage aren't all crayons and rainbows, as more than a few of the girls living here are being abused by the headmaster, Dr. 
Dr. Hoffman, which is in no uncertain terms the primary antecedent for the cruelty the children exhibit and justify throughout the story, but we'll get more into that later. One night, Hoffman abandons the orphanage, blames the orphans for abandoning them, as you do. This event causes the children to become left to their own devices, ushering in the rise to the true power of the red crayon aristocracy. This very decision, both cruel and callous, will ultimately prove fatal for every child here as the orphanage is eventually attacked by Gregory while everyone is living here, reportedly killing every child inside. Why he does this, when he does this, and who exactly is affected are all things we'll get into a bit later. For right now, let's meet our characters. Each member of the aristocracy is part of a hierarchy that ranges from poor to princess, and not everyone is pleased to occupy the seats they do. At the very tip top of the aristocracy, we have Wendy, the lonely princess, characterized early as incredibly soft and sweet, and oddly the only member of the aristocracy who extends any kindness towards Jennifer. Diana, the strong-willed princess, is the oldest member, sitting somewhere around her mid-teens and acts as something of the strong arm of the group, exhibiting an easy cruelty in her nature, the reasons for which become much clearer as the tale unfolds. Sitting alongside Diana near the top of the aristocracy are Eleanor, the cold princess, and Meg, the wise-looking princess. Eleanor earned the namesake of the Cold Princess due to her extremely introverted and seemingly unaffected personality, which often makes the others uneasy in their struggle to know exactly what she's thinking. She's often seen with a birdcage carrying her pet bird, which seems to be the only thing we can see clearly that she values, and the only thing the girls know of that brings her happiness. Meg, on the other hand, is quite the opposite. With a nature both transparent and condescending, she fashions herself the intellectual of the group and carries more than a little pride in knowing it. She's also the inventor of more than a few torture devices, some of which we'll become all too familiar with before long, particularly the onion bag. The onion bag is beyond fucked up. No, 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 no. And finally, at the very bottom, we have Amanda, the small-hearted princess, who is more or less the token insecure fat kid of the group, but she's also one of the most interesting to me personally, and I think a big part of that is how real this character feels. Whereas some of these characters can seem more intelligent, cunning, or poetic in their personalities and actions, I feel like Amanda is one of the most reflective of a real person, in a game already stunningly reflective of real people. We also have a few other kids who are technically a part of the Red Crayon group, but aren't necessarily enrolled within the aristocracy, and they're mainly younger children and serve a much more peripheral role in the narrative. Please stop doing that. Stop putting your hands in your... What? Stop looking at me while you do it! While fitting neatly into their own archetypes, each member of the aristocracy feels both alive and real, but also uncannily dreamlike, never feeling quite like caricatures, nor exactly like someone you've met in real life. The frequencies of this eerie dissonance between reality and fantasy carries through everything in the game, from characters and environments to storytelling and level design. Everything in Rule of Rose occupies a kind of uncanny dreamlike state of being that never feels quite real, but also not nearly as fictitious as we'd expect. Or in Jennifer's case, certainly not as fictitious as we'd hope. Okay, so those are the primary human characters, so to speak, but there's also plenty of things in the game I would refer to as characters that aren't what you'd classically think of as such. For example, the save points in the game are called Bucket Knights, and they aren't just quirky little scarecrows that allow you to save your game. They also speak to you and even give you clues as to where to go or what your current objective is, which is a huge quality of life boost in a survival horror game. Rule of Rose is filled with in-game, in-universe guides regarding your objectives instead of markers or waypoints, but they aren't as ephemeral or obtuse as a character telling you something and you just having to remember. You can return to the bucket night at any time and get a reminder of where you need to go. Beside every bucket night is a rubbish bin, and holy fucking shit, this metal garbage can is what true quadruple A game development should look like. I'll say it, Rule of Rose has the best inventory box system I've ever seen in a survival horror game. While it may just seem like a Resident Evil style item box that you can store endless amounts of items in and retrieve them at any other rubbish bin location, it's even better than that, which as you know, is a toweringly high bar. The primary reason for this greatness is the ability to press drop on any item 
anywhere and it automatically gets sent to the rubbish bin and it does not in any way make the game easier or thoughtless as some of you sickos might be thinking right now. You still have to backtrack to one to swap certain items and retrieve what you need and you only have a narrow amount of space and what you can carry on your person. So there is still plenty of room left for inventory management. I know that's what you're looking for you little nasties. Okay, so there's one more incredibly important character in this story that we have to talk about right now, and that's the setting of the game, both Cardington, England, and the airship itself, which I consider to be a monumental character in the story of this game. Both are intrinsically linked to the game's narrative, symbolism, and gameplay in a much heavier way than people seem to be giving it credit for. This is because the setting for Rule of Rose makes it not only a psychological horror game, but a historical one. History Lessons with Mort! You see, Cardington is much more than just a little nondescript English countryside to suit as a canvas for Jennifer's experience. Cardington Bedfordshire, or Cardington Bedfordshire, is home to the Cardington Airship Hangar erected by the Short Brothers in 1915 and serves as the birthplace for the R101, an actual airship that did take off from this very village. The R101 airship did indeed crash, not in June of 1929, but rather in October 1930, and it did leave behind a survivor. Well, actually, it left behind six survivors, killing 48 of the 54 people on board. The reason this is so important is because the history that served as inspiration for its story is woven into a manner of facets within the game itself, even coming down to things like the rope we so often see throughout the game, which sure may not always be a reference to airships, but rope is a key feature in balloon aviation, and it's not a coincidence that the rope that manages to restrain her and others is something so closely associated with the things that killed her parents. History Lessons with Mort! While Rule of Rose is technically a survival horror game, complete with most of the genre's traditional mechanics and level design, it's not, and get ready for this, it's not really a survival horror game. Hold up, wait, wait, wait. I actually think that's exactly what makes it so great. In fact, I'd even take things a step further and say it's actually something of an insulting oversimplification in a way to call this game survival horror, and it really doesn't fit in when I see photos on Twitter of Jennifer next to Heather Mason and Jill Valentine. This is a completely disingenuous comparison. However, I totally get it because, of course, the gameplay itself speaks to the same type of person who enjoys those games. However, it's hideously reductive. The survival horror clothing this game is wearing is something of a Trojan horse in my perspective. Sneaking an incredibly beautiful, touching, and uniquely everlasting tale of sorrow and longing into the homes of those likely not expecting and in many cases not interested in that kind of story. Rule of Rose feels like there was a horrible event that would take place in a horror game and levels that are clearly survival horror levels with horror enemies, then long after said event takes place, those levels were happened upon by a group of children and we're kind of wandering through the detritus of this horror without us actually behind the focus of the horror in as much as witnesses to it. Then as time progresses, these characters become more and more influenced and in a way infected by the world they wandered in. To. That's obviously not actually relevant to the plot of the game in any way, it's just kind of the best way I can explain how I see this game, at least from a genre perspective. It's very surreal. And while there is plenty of emphasis on backtracking, it doesn't focus really at all on shortcuts, which in and of itself removes its placement in the survival horror category. No shortcuts, no deal! Another thing that sets it apart from other sixth generation horror games is how linear and easy to follow the quests are, but without holding your hand or giving you any kind of wonky waypoint. There's something about Rule of Rose that manages to balance that kind of obtuse nature of the genre we love while not being a straightforward hand-holding experience. There's a bracer to the left of the chest. Maybe you can light it? it? Trust the player, but also provides you with just enough info and clues for you to figure it out on your own. And if you can't, you just ask the Bucket Knight. He usually doesn't give you exactly what you need to know. It's often wrapped in a riddle of some kind, but it's not usually too hard to decipher. All right, y'all, so I don't usually go into complete story rundowns, but if we're going to talk about this game, we're going to f***ing talk about this game. And we really can't do that without becoming as entangled within it as Jennifer herself. So now begins a regret incredibly long and likely clumsy recollection of the events within the game itself from front to back. Hey, where I reach my shade when I call your name.
The game's story really starts in earnest in the second chapter, The Unlucky Cloverfield. Waking up on the airship tied to a post, something we'll get pretty familiar with as things play out, we're being taunted and watched by a boy on the other side of the wall. He eventually lets us go after fulfilling his Porky's fantasy, and we're free to explore our surroundings where things definitely become a bit more complex from a level design perspective, with the airship being staggeringly large in surface area, and you've got a whole hell of a lot of freedom at your disposal, being able to traverse much of the ship from the jump. We make what is likely the most important discovery of the whole game very early on in this section, that being a dog strung up and whimpering. Sadly, we can't rescue him quite yet and are left to weep into our controllers. I'll be back, buddy. I love you so much already. We run into most of the NPCs we're going to be interacting with going forward, and we also find our first objective. Each chapter's objective is in the form of a monthly gift requested by the aristocracy written on the club door. So with that, we get started on finding our butterfly. After doing some exploration and finding some scissors, not those scissors for some reason, why won't you let me pick up those f***ing scissors? We get to free our dog and give him the collar we picked up earlier. What a good boy. Brown is by far the most central character both to the narrative and our gameplay experience. When we first get Brown as our companion, I was very nervous. This was either gonna become an escort mission or something like that. And I'm overall like not someone who's particularly hot on NPC companions and games in the first place especially animal companions, but Brown is perfect. He's your compass, your clue finder, not that clue finder, and the game would be a complete mess without him. You see, throughout each chapter, you find key items, which are usually clues linked to other key items, and you can place these key items in the find box of your inventory, press triangle, and Brown will sniff for the corresponding clue, leading you to the next area and preventing you from getting lost, while also giving you a better in-game compass than a gaudy waypoint. Everything is in game. Not only that, but your inventory also tells you if each item will help you find more clues or if that's all you needed to use it to find. So you can just drop the item once you found the next thing or once there's no more outstanding clues. Brown is the goodest boy. Look at him. Animal companions in games even 20 years after this don't have a companion system this good, and it's easily the best companion system I've ever seen. It's instrumental in making the game's quest design shine as brilliantly as it does. I love him so much, I'll never let anything bad happen to you. Not long after finding Brown and the butterfly we've been seeking, we're faced with our first combat encounter. People have often remarked that the combat in this game is bad, and it's the weakest part of it. And I would agree, but to this point anyway, it wasn't nearly as bad as I had been led to believe. If you've played as many survival horror games as I have, you get pretty comfortable in the bad combat scenario. Okay, uh, well, okay, well that was a bit annoying. Look, usually when I think bad combat, my mind immediately goes to things like bad aiming, slow attack speed, or the clunky stun locking in something like Silent Hill 1. But usually, at least within the oatmeal I referred to as a brain, it comes down to a black and white, try hit thing is bad, no bonk when should be bonk, why no bonk? But this game's combat issues are nearly as deep and multifaceted as the story itself. Speaking of Silent Hill 1, why are we fighting gray children-like enemies from Silent Hill 1, a game that was shat on for having bad combat in 1990-whatever-the-hell in a 2006 PS2 game? Who in the development team at Punchline saw these guys and went, yes, that's what our game is missing? I do know one thing, though. Bitches, they come, they go. The lore behind the imps is tremendous, as they're said to represent Jennifer's fear of discovering the truth of her own memories, always standing in the way before recalling the most crucial parts of her trauma, which is exactly the kind of symbolism we look for in a great psychological horror game. And in a lore sense, they're pulled off beautifully. In fact, every enemy in the game, be it a boss or otherwise, is made up of a greater symbolism to Jennifer and her experiences. And while we won't be going into every enemy in that kind of detail, 
detail, as in that in and of itself, would make this video a whole fucking hour longer. If you want me to talk about that more, let me know in the comments. Maybe we can revisit that somewhere down the line. I'd love to talk about this game more. I, I, I want to keep talking about this game. I didn't know much of the cool lore while playing through the game, obviously, but even not knowing any of that, the combat was bad enough to remark on, but nothing that's exactly game ruining for me. I'm confident my opinion on this will not change. Once we finish the combat encounter, we present our gift to the group and are immediately accosted by Diana, who tells us we're nothing and calls Amanda into a kind of hazing ritual where Amanda smooshes a living rat onto a stick into her face until she faints, and Amanda quivers with what I can only interpret as very conflicting emotions. At the top of the next chapter, Amanda has us meet with her on the roof of the airship where we get to witness one of the most spectacular cutscenes in the game and one that gives us a taste of just how breathtaking this game is from a cinematic and narrative perspective. So I'm just going to let it play. <laughs> I had no choice. They would have hurt us both one day. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But it's my turn. Don't think you have to hold back. But you will not be this. And this. And this. And this. Oh, and this. And like this. And this. We're still friends, aren't we? I know we're still friends, don't we? <laughs> In this single cutscene, we see Amanda's damage, her guilt, shame and desperate behavioral difficulties in a visceral way I had no idea a game from this era could deliver. The goal of this chapter is to serve up Sir Peter, Wendy's pet rabbit who has seemingly run away. During the search, we run into Gregory, though while playing through the first time, have no idea who he is or why he's here or why he's an adult who is alive. And this confusion is a theme which continues throughout the airship section of the game as the memory of Gregory just seems to haunt us without any obvious meaning as he invades her memories and little flashes here and there. Using Brown's incredible little sniffer, we find a bloody bag we presume to be Sir Peter and are faced with our first boss fight, which is with Hoffman, someone we aren't familiar with yet at this point, but you all now know to be the headmaster. However, he's hardly recognizable in his rope bunny getup. And oddly enough, he's not the only rope bunny in this game. Okay, so the fight with Hoffman really cleared things up for me about why the combat is so legendary in its derision. Every single time you take damage, you get knocked off your feet, and because the enemies move persistently, when you get up, there's a 50% chance or more they're going to knock you down again before you can move because you can't dodge and you can't run. Every time Jennifer gets hit, she lays on the ground as if she's having a narcoleptic episode or perhaps just mourning no longer being standing, and this is not unique to the Hoffman fight. This is the case in every combat scenario. And speaking of speed and not being able to run away, the second you get low on health, you begin trudging at a snail's pace, at which point you may as well just reload your last save because look at this! Where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do with this? We eventually manage to kill Hoffman. The imps drag him away. The bag turns out not to contain a dead rabbit at all, but rather an alive one. Jennifer gets promoted for her efforts, Amanda gets demoted, and now Jennifer has to poke the rat stick in Amanda's face, causing them both to faint. This is where the game splits into a kind of choose your own adventure story, as the boy giving us books gives us three books to choose from. 
each of which takes us to a different section of the game to complete the book's corresponding section. I pretty much chose them at random, and the order in which I completed them was Bird of Happiness, The Goat Sisters, and Mermaid Princess. The Bird of Happiness was probably my least favorite section from a gameplay perspective, but one of my favorite from a story perspective. Diana and Meg steal Eleanor's bird in a way to try to get to her and break through her cold facade, but end up suffocating it to death on accident. They can be heard later placing bets on whether or not Eleanor will be sad or angry, and the goal for this chapter is to deliver the bird as the monthly gift. This section is another great example of the children being realistically cruel as opposed to some of the more fantastical elements of their torturous nature, like the highly organized ceremonial rat stick or the coffin toss which is exemplified best when Jennifer overhears the girls in the bathroom disparaging Eleanor, a kind of petty shit-talking I imagine many girls can relate to in some degree. When we eventually find the bird, of course, Eleanor comes in right at the perfect time, making Jennifer appear to have been the killer. While Jennifer pleads that it wasn't her, Eleanor gives neither reaction Meg or Diana was expecting by simply dropping it into the gift box. The Bird of Happiness is a very Eleanor-heavy chapter, as we also find newspaper clippings referring to her parents' troubled marriage and come upon the inference that Eleanor was placed into the orphanage due to neither of her parents taking custody of her. Whether or not she was this cold, seemingly emotionally neutral character before she arrived here isn't known, but after being essentially abandoned by her parents after bearing witness to such callous acts, the cause for such emotional stasis begins making much more sense. Now, what I don't like about this chapter is the maze-like, repetitive level design that feels very tedious, very fast. The loop here is such that you have to wade through a series of different nearly identical hallways for identical doors in order to find the right room. If you find the wrong room, then a giant bird thing fucks you up and knocks your lights out. All the while, different girls are mocking you for being lost. Finding the right room among a maze of identical rooms reminded me a lot of late nights as a pizza delivery driver in my youth having to find the right apartment at night and getting so mad I wanted to commit arson, which is similarly how I felt playing this section. The Goat Sisters is the shortest, wherein Diana asked Jennifer to find the remnants of a love letter Meg wrote to Diana before Diana tore it up in annoyance at Meg's apparent simpage. It turns out Diana tore up the letter and attempted to feed it to Mary and Sally, a couple pet goats we meet earlier. Oh. However, after they refused to eat it, Diana stuffed the rest of the letter into the belly of a goat corpse. We track down the other half of the letter with brown spectacular snoot. What a good boy. Then we end up in a boss fight with an anthropomorphic version of the goats. Once we win the charitably easy fight and retrieve the letter, Jennifer is framed once again and punished, this time being tortured in one of Meg's lovely contraptions known as the onion bag. While the onion bag is quite brilliant from a torture device standpoint, this cutscene enraged me to no end, as without having the proper context, Jennifer just seems to continue letting these genocidal children lie about her, walk all over her, and frame her for what appeared to be no apparent reason. The final section of the three we can choose from was The Mermaid Princess, a chapter most notable for what many, including myself, consider the hardest boss fight of the game, which is against The Mermaid Princess, a twisted, bound, monstrous representation of a girl named Clara who, until this point, has played a minimal role in the story and in the final game's release in general. She's hanging from the ceiling by rope, swiping at you, puking toxic vomit everywhere. You stay away from my dog, bitch! If there was any moment in this game I would say is the most dense in its symbolism, it would be this one. Every inch of this fight and the Clara Mermaid Princess character overall has been analyzed to death and justifiably so. Clara was the orphan Hoffman had abused the most, even shuddering when he speaks to her in a later chapter. Looking at the Mermaid Princess character model, we can see that her body is highly exposed and that the mermaid fin hardly covering much of her body is made entirely of rope. The rope is clearly a reference to her abuse and feelings of being trapped but another clear indication of her abuse are the cuts covering her wrist, alluding to her self-harm. A little further down this particular symbolism iceberg are theories relating to the stitches and surgical marks on her body, most notably of which being the horizontal stitching across her chest and the vertical ones along her belly. Many believe the ab abdominable... Ab 
Abominable? The, many believe the abdominal stitches to be the result of an abortion or C-section and correlate that to the vomit, which many infer to symbolize morning sickness or even bulimia. While I think personally morning sickness could be a thing here, I worry that that one might be a little too on the nose for the writing style this game has presented thusly, and I always figured it was a reference to the kind of sickness and nausea coping with a traumatic event can bring, especially being trapped in that traumatic cycle. What I think is more interesting, however, are the the horizontal stitchings across her chest, which I immediately clocked as a reference to the common urge to remove that which makes a victim of sexual abuse feel attractive to their assailant. She's also crying out and wailing during the fight, turning from laughter to sobbing, and while the voice is a very neat mechanic and adds even more weight to this already heavy layer of the game's story, I didn't know any of this shit while I was playing the game and just thought I was fighting a big rope fish bitch. So to me in the moment, her voice sounded exactly like George Gagne from Michigan Report from Hell. <laughs> which broke my immersion a bit. It also broke my teeth as I ground them into paste trying to kill this stupid fish. By the way, if you get anywhere near her vomit or God forbid are taking a little snooze after getting hit and get thrown up on while laying down, that's essentially a game over. You get stun locked in the puke and if you do get away and don't have any healing items, which you can definitely run out of as this fight is long as hell, you end up trudging around the room and don't have the speed necessary to get even close to her as she moves around the room or get away when she comes near you. By this point in the game, I was officially in the this game's combat is so bad it's actually kind of a deal breaker stage of grief. This brings us to the gingerbread house chapter, where things really start to shift gears from a kind of Lord of the Flies bully simulator to something even more thematically and narratively dense and nuanced than anything we've experienced to this point, if you can believe that. Waking up in the aristocrats club room as usual, Jennifer finds the boys missing and gets pulled away by a pair of hands. She then comes to in a rose garden near the orphanage and we see Gregory standing over her, much like he did upon discovering her at the, after the airship crash. Jennifer wanders through the garden, commits a timid B&E on a nearby house, which turns out to be Gregory's, where she remembers the six months or so she spent living here, imprisoned by the psychologically eroded Gregory and being forced to live as Joshua. We relive the beginning of the story, where Wendy shows up and rescues us while Gregory searches for us outside. We give Wendy a bear we find inside, which she asks for and names Joshua, trades us her brooch for the bear, and the chapter ends. There are a couple extremely interesting things to this section of the story beyond the things we've already discussed, most of which involving Wendy, a character that to this point has been more or less in the shadows, playing a minimal role despite being at the tip top of the hierarchy. While rescuing us, she tells us to take Gregory's gun for his own safety due to his suicidal ideations, but after failing to do so, we realize she already took it. Now, at first glance, it's like, oh, nice bro, thank you. But then that begs a question of how did she know where to find it? And furthermore, how did she know he was suicidal in the first place? The next chapter has us back onto the airship. The aristocracy is losing their shit because the bear we gave Wendy is missing. Amanda is immediately paranoid that we suspect her of stealing it because Amanda's the fucking worst, but blames Wendy. Oh shit, Wendy, you good? Turns out the aristocracy already accused her of stealing the bear and she doesn't have it. We see Amanda doing some weird shit, follow her to an elevator which is down because the boys in this game are dumb as shit, fix the power, and catch up with Amanda just in time to see another amazing cutscene of this game also involving Amanda. you I fucking knew it give it as a gift and you'll be miss popular again <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
At the top of the next chapter, time shifts backwards, and we are back in the orphanage when Hoffman was still there. Well, we're tied up again. I swear this bitch can't catch up. Brown? Brown! I swear to God, bro, if this dog is dead, I'm deleting my fucking channel. Brown! Oh, thank Christ. I I really like this channel. That would really suck. Open your fucking ears, bud. I about had a heart attack. What a good boy. Hoffman gives us shit for playing hooky before giving us an order. But exactly what he says in this sentence is very, very important. He says, come to my office later. Don't you forget. This one piece of dialogue is responsible for one of the most hideously aggravating experiences I've ever had in a game. Remember when I said, This delicious delicacy that made me weep like a child longing for a time I never knew turned on me like a gas station hot dog. This is where it starts. And it's a real bummer because look how pretty everything is. This is some of the best lighting I've seen on the sixth generation. And the sun setting through the windows carries an effervescent warmth of fall you can taste. I'm sent back to my own childhood in the Midwest like the guy eating rat food and ratatouille. I was in bliss. A record player is spinning the same song over and over, but in a kind of music from another room way that just drop kicks me into a blissful stupor of nostalgia. It's really something. But then... Then I end up getting a little confused and more than just a little turned around as the more I explore, the more I find that nearly every door in this goddamn labyrinth opens and every single one of them leads me nowhere. Well, that's not exactly true. I did find this ax, but where is everyone? What am I supposed to be doing? No rooms are marked clearly on the map. Half the rooms in the building are just called hallway. And where is everyone? After 20 minutes of this, I really started to break. So I said, you know what? The headmaster said to come back later. So I might as well just try his door anyway. And guess what? That's the piece I was missing. Now that I've spoken to him, all of the children have moved and I have to explore the entire house again. Some of you may be yelling at your screens right now that I did this to myself, but he said later, later, not now, later. This is not on me. So I go and I traverse the entire labyrinth again. I try to speak to each character, all of whom ignore you and throw things at you. And by the end of this section, I had heard that song on repeat for a half an hour or more. But finally, as I'm brought to my knees, it's over. I finally get the final note thrown at me, and then I get kicked down the stairs. Bitch, I have a fire axe. Why are you letting them do this to you? To us. So all the enemies come back, and then from here, we traverse the section again, this time while being surrounded by enemies to fight a certain number of mini bosses, so to speak, in order to unlock the courtyard door to get to Wendy, all while finding your way through the maze, alone, hurt, afraid, and hopeless, and constantly being stunlocked. It was at this point in the game, I, I wanted to be done. The level design had suddenly completely lost its footing and now it's a confusing maze that isn't fun or interesting which is only partially my fault but eventually we make our way through Wendy is here in the courtyard she pets Brown while I read a little book titled The Funeral. When I finish Wendy and Brown are gone. What the f**k? Where is my dog? Oh god, oh god he's, he's dead? No Oh god, he's, okay. It was just a hallucination. Okay, let's keep going. Ah! Okay, another hallucination. Th this goes on for a bit, and we continue seeing hallucinations of Brown's body before eventually meeting up with the aristocrat club and getting to the bottom of this. This is maybe the best, most important scene in the game, so we're just gonna watch it together, and I'm going to shut up. <laughs>
After hours of despising Jennifer for letting all those girls walk all over her and feeling nothing but rage for the last hour of gameplay, I finally started to understand what was going on here and why all of this was happening. And like, dude, she slapped the shit out of her. Did you see that? I really felt that shit. This moment is essentially the catalyst for our entire story. All of Jennifer's weaknesses and fear, all of her inaction, everything I've spent so much of my playthrough resenting her for is an illustration of her own guilt and shame for Brown's death and her inability to prevent it. So yeah, Diana, Meg, Amanda, all these kids are plenty brutal and cruel, but now we really get to see the true villain of the game, which is Princess Wendy. It turns out that when Jennifer met Brown, it made Wendy extremely jealous, which caused her to use the aristocracy as a vehicle with which to punish Jennifer. So when that didn't work, she ordered Brown's death through the aristocracy. You may not believe it, but murdering Jennifer's dog is not actually even the worst thing she's responsible for. Remember when I said Gregory would eventually show up and massacre the entire orphanage? Well, we've arrived. When Jennifer Will Smith slaps the taste out of Wendy's mouth, it causes Wendy to go to Gregory's, dress up in his dead child Joshua's clothing, and spend several weeks manipulating his rotting brain into becoming the monster we now see before us, the stray dog. Due to her selfish actions, the stray dog kills every child in the orphanage, causing Wendy eventually to realize how bad she done fuck and hands us the gun before she is also killed. While we can use the gun on him for this boss fight, or we can just hack him to death with the fire axe, it actually makes no sense to do so because the gun only has one bullet in the chamber. So you notice he stops mid fight and puts his hands in front of him and cries, and then he goes back to fighting you again. Well, in that animation, we can hand him the gun. Upon doing this, it causes a cutscene, and he pulls the trigger on himself, traumatizing Jennifer again. Hmm. Yes. This is, essentially, the end of the story. However, there is one final section that serves to tie everything together and make us cry one final time. Here, in the final section, we play as young Jennifer. She sees Wendy kisses her on the head, symbolically showing her that she harbors no hate for her any longer, leaves the orphanage behind, and remembers the first time she met Brown, and while he is dead in real time as she remembers all of this, she will at the very least always have his memory with her, and the memory of happiness that she felt when she first ran into him, and sometimes a memory of happiness is enough. Rule of Rose was released in North America on September 12th of 2006 after an extremely long and arduous pre-release cycle where a multitude of news sources slandered, disparaged, and flat out lied about the game, causing something of a moral panic in Europe with unfounded media claims from everything from underage eroticism and sadomasochism to obscene cruelty and obscenity reaching all the way to the European Union. There are a few things I believe to be the primary cause of this controversy, and they all work together in a beautiful concerto of idiocy. First of all, Rule of Rose is a horror game about children. Horrifying things happen. There's blood. There are evil acts done to and done by children. Is there much more to it than that? Of course there is. But that brings me to the next player in the controversy, which is the incredible buffoonery of journalists and politicians, especially in the 2000s, who don't care about, nor are they interested in, any sense of nuance or deeper analysis, or conversely, even playing the fucking game. They see this and think, bad kids, bad kids get hurt, scary things, dog kids killed by children, evil man is rope bunny, evil rope bunny man kills child, bad, bad, no, and that's the end of it. A game like that was going to spark controversy no matter what, but it was made all the more controversial because this is a game, and old people, especially in this era, thought games could influence behavior, and furthermore, that all video games as a medium are aimed at children. So yeah, 
No shit, the fumbling dummies in charge are gonna freak out, right? But that's just covering the violence part of the game. There is no sexual content in this game beyond the creepy Hoffman stuff, something that isn't covered by these publications as it doesn't happen in the trailer or opening cutscenes, so obviously no one covering the game made it that far. But there's one more integral player in this cacophony of goof I want to specifically focus on, being the unbelievably bad luck the game had in which journalists covered it. Tenko Mushi covers a ton of this in her incredible video, which is much more detailed on the game's controversial release, so definitely check that out if you want to learn more about why and how all this happened. But for me, I want to highlight this one particular interview with Ishiwaka and Sony producer Yayu Takayama in a somewhat infamous 2006 interview with a publication known at the time as Game of Sutra, which is better known today as GameDeveloper.com. The conductor of the interview, in another turn of bad luck, was Brandon Sheffield. Brandon Sheffield is no stranger to pearl-clutching tomfoolery, as he is also responsible for hilariously leading a moral crusade against the tentacle p <sighs> game Tentacle Bento, saying it offended him, and that, quote, the women who shill it demean themselves. So then, what could a dude who would go on to write a 1,500-word article on being offended by tentacle p <sighs> card games have to inquire about Rule of Rose? Quote, what was the inspiration for using sexuality of prepubescent girls as a theme in the game? <laughs> Jesus f***ing Christ, my guy! We wanted to depict the darker side of children. Not really dark per se, but if you really think about kids, they aren't really afraid of the same things that adults are, and often aren't aware of the consequences. Something that may seem benign to them may seem wrong or frightening to adults, but it's really just a form of innocence. We sort of wanted to show not only how scary adults can be from a child's perspective, because that been touched on many times, but also how scary children can be from an adult's perspective. We want to see that contrast. And then Brandon immediately pushes back with, that makes sense, we didn't really get into the sexuality there though. What the f***? Dude, there is one sexuality! But they humor him anyway, going on to say, if we look at it through the eyes of adults, when girls play with each other in this way, it may be considered somewhat erotic, but with kids, I really don't think they'd see it that way. It's more genuine, not lustful. It may appear so because these are things kids actually do, but we don't want to see. Okay, not a bad response. Your move, Brandon. Do either of you have children? <laughs> no. Does anyone on the team have children? <laughs> yes. Did they contribute any kind of insight? Well, we actually gathered a bunch of kids and watched them and recorded their voices. And for the game's texture and models, we took pictures of them. We also had them write down or draw things that made them happy or made them scared. We definitely did a lot of research. And then Brandon says, European children or Japanese children? What do you care? What does this matter? What are you getting at, you fucking weirdo? Okay, so I have one final piece to mention on Rule of Rose before we wrap up, and that's a very personal reason as to why this game struck such a chord with me as an individual and why dingbat articles like this elicit such an emotional response from me. Throughout the mid to late 2010s, I was a social worker whose job revolved around behaviorally challenged children, where I worked day in and day out with kids just like those portrayed in this game who were plenty capable of things that were equally as cruel and at times vicious as those found in Rule of Rose. And also like those kids, it was because they themselves had been brutalized throughout their lives to such a degree that acting this way was normal to them, and that reacting violently and with malice wasn't at all weird, and also like the children of this game, it does not make them bad people. To quote Kristoff in The Truman Show, We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. So, if a child is raised in an environment that normalizes abuse, then all the more normal it can become for them to act out on that abuse on others. This is something most of us recognize. We all know that hurt people hurt people, right? But as someone who had the very unique experience of working with learning disabled and behaviorally challenged youth, some of whom were spitting images of the children in this game, Rule of Rose really hit home for me. It's a story that is about so much, but at the end of the day, it's about traumatized children, all of whom end up dying due to their own misguided decisions in a world they were not given the proper tools to navigate and without the guidance and protection they deserved. Children who should have known better, but weren't given the example or choice to do better. 
It's a beautiful tale, but moreover, it speaks to things that many of us who have experienced trauma either as a child or adult can relate to in a huge way. But I'd like to finish this video off with a reminder that while Rule of Rose is filled with fantastical elements, this game remains maybe one of the least fictitious stories I've seen presented in this medium, and children like this who have experienced things like this do exist. These things are real, and we need to be talking about them openly and honestly, and there's nothing in this medium that does it with as much grace, tact, and care as Rule of Rose. This video would not have been possible without the incredibly passionate Rule of Rose community, both in their tremendous documentation efforts within various wikis and fan sites. I would like to specifically credit at Unlucky Girl on Twitter, who personally assisted me with various documentations and videos that aided me greatly in my research, as well as providing me with a bevy of research they themselves have conducted and published over on their Red Crayon Aristocrat Fan Club Twitter page, as well as just being someone I could hit up whenever and be like, hey, this doesn't make sense. What am I missing here? So thank you so much for bearing with me and for being so gracious with your knowledge. Thank you also to my Patreon supporters, Mr. Nobody, and to all of you watching for the support you've shown this channel's just four short months of existence. Please like and subscribe. You're always welcome in our Discord, which is linked in my bio. So check that out or join us for a stream right here on this channel most evenings, kind of-ish, kind a lot of evenings. And of course, the biggest thank you to all of you for bearing with me on such a long video. There's so much more I want to say, so if you guys dug this and want more Rule of Rose content, I'd love to go and more in depth. There's shit I didn't cover. Like, I didn't cover the music. How did I not cover the music? The music is tremendous. I never want to stop listening to this. There's also a bunch of cut content and varieties of other things we didn't cover here today. I would have loved to have gone into everything, but honestly, if I didn't stop myself from writing more, this video would have never gotten done. Anyway, thank you all so much, and I'll smell you later.